What is going on everybody? Welcome in to the reveal of the number 21 team in my 2022 NFL Power Rankings as we are going to take a deep dive into the Pittsburgh Steelers. Before we get started though, if you could just do me a huge favor, please do hit that like button down below. The last couple videos have had a drop in both like count and views, so I just want to remind you guys it really does help. These videos take me 16 plus hours each, a lot of sweat and effort goes into these videos so it's important to me that they do well and you hitting that like button goes a long way to support the channel if you do want to show your support in other ways that paypal link is down there below also my patreon is always available for you to support the channel and get uh, exclusive content as well and if you enjoy the video make sure you subscribe turn on notifications so you do not miss any of these deep dive team previews as we count down to the number one team in these power rankings. But without further ado, let's talk about the Stullers. And they did it again last year, man. They kept Mike Tomlin's record of in 15 seasons, no losing record as a head coach, which to me is maybe the most impressive standing record in the NFL right now. And they had to do it by winning ugly, scratching and clawing with a basically rotten Big Ben that could hardly throw a football anymore. It was an impressive season, but uh, let's face it, they've got the odds stacked against them again this year as the AFC is just locked and absolutely loaded this year. And they have a new quarterback situation among some other deficiencies on this team. But it's also hard to kind of bet against these Steelers at the same time as they've proved us time and time again. So it's going to be a fun one. Let's talk about this team's offseason that I do think was a, a pretty good one. As we start with their key departures, we are going to witness some staff changes, though I think it's pretty minor and potentially even an upgrade. Keith Butler, 66 years old, is going to retire here. Seven years as the defensive coordinator for the Steelers did obviously a damn good job, but this Steelers staff is a machine, especially when you want to talk about churning out defensive minds. So they're promoting internally as they love to do with Terrell Austin. And they're also bringing in Brian Flores, the former head coach of the Dolphins, who we just talked about a decent amount having the Dolphins deep dive coming in with our last episode here so you know terrell austin's no slouch and you add brian flores into the mix there like i think that's probably a net positive and that's no disrespect to keith butler who did a freaking amazing job uh, they're also losing their quarterback big ben to retirement pretty safe to say that's likely to be addition by subtraction was one of the worst quarterbacks in the entire nfl last year was hard to watch at times they're also losing some bigger named players but guys that were actually injured last year and were not factors so much in their winning season last year so juju smith schuster stefan to as well retires but he didn't play a single snap for them last year i don't think a lot of people realize that to be honest uh, then they're also going to be losing Trey Turner, who was a one-year band-aid at right guard, but doing a good job to supplement that uh, for me by getting a better player in James Daniels. They lose Joe Schobert, replacing him with a better former Jags linebacker in Miles Jack. Joe Hayden, a veteran, no longer on the team. They sign Levi Wallace, who's been a, a starter for years in Buffalo, to me an upgrade there. So every departure they had i think they supplemented it with an upgrade and then some so in the draft they go and get kenny pickett in the first round who we'll talk about shortly along with mitch trubisky former starter for the bears who took a, a rehab year in buffalo if you will they also draft george pickens and sign Mason Cole on the offense who did start a few games for the Vikings last year going to compete for center for the Steelers team and then on defense they add Larry Ogunjobi after Tuit retires they get Tyson Alualu back who got hurt in week two last year for the season and a sneaky good signing at a safety position of need for this team in DeMonte Casey, who's been a little bit of an underrated player over the last few years, was in Dallas last year, uh, Atlanta before that. So a pretty kind of sneaky good offseason for the Steelers when I sat down to put this 
sheet together, I was like, wow, that was actually a pretty nice offseason for the Steelers. Not a surprise. This front office is perennially great, uh, but not a team a lot of people are talking about right now, a team that was a playoff team last year that I do think is a better team this year. It's just going to be a matter of schedule and depth in the conference as far as if they can, you know, keep Mike Tomlin's incredible record of never having a losing season alive, honestly. And, and we'll talk about that at the end of this video, what my expectations are for this team. But I want to talk a little bit more about the coach and what the scheme is going to look like on both sides of the ball here. Then we're going to go deep into this roster, preview every position group, how they stack up against the rest of the league. Then we'll do my win projection stuff. But let's talk about the coach and the scheme here, starting up top with Mike Tomlin, who I rank as the eighth best coach in the NFL. We've already mentioned that record that he's got going, which is, is just so freaking impressive to never have a losing season in 15 years. Like usually something crazy happens where you just, you lose, you have a bad year, even when you're a great coach like, like Mike Tomlin. So uh, we, we know that he is going to defy the odds and as the sort of CEO of this team, he just raises the floor because the expectations are high. He inspires these guys to play their ass off. Uh, it really motivates player development and, and everything that establishes, to me, one of the best cultures of, of any team in the NFL. So a ringing endorsement of Mike Tomlin. And he does have a defensive background. It's important to remember that. He kind of oversees this defense. But make no mistake about it, this is Terrell Austin's defense, along with potentially some pretty heavy influence by uh, Brian Flores, who's going to be the linebacker coach and defensive senior assistant. So just really three at least defensive coordinator caliber coaches on staff here with Tomlin, and Terrell Austin and Brian Flores. But Austin is getting what is going to be his third opportunity as a defensive coordinator. Uh, you go back to his early days as a young coach. He learned under Dean Pease in Baltimore. Then he went to Detroit for three years as a defensive coordinator. And I think he was respected for what he did there. Remember, Detroit actually made the playoffs with a, a kind of overachieving defense under Terrell Austin's unit. I want to say that was that would have been 2016, maybe 15. Um, but Caldwell eventually gets fired and Terrell Austin with him goes to Cincinnati where kind of everybody was going to die at that point in time. That was pre Joe Burrow era. Uh, and then he ends up back here in Pittsburgh in 2019 where he's been kind of groomed now for this third opportunity where I do think this is going to be his best run and definitely wouldn't be a surprise to me if he is the next Steelers defensive coordinator that has a seven, eight year run of, of winning football here in great defense. So uh, no problem with them promoting Terrell Austin, definitely well qualified. And I actually ranked the Steelers as a team second in defensive coaching, even though it's a new defensive coordinator here, this is what they do. They replace, they have a next man up mentality and they develop everything within this organization and, and Terrell Austin is is no different. So uh, I have full confidence that they are going to earn the benefit of the doubt with, with how well this defense will be coached and that will result in not just good defensive play calling and everything, but player development and earning that benefit of the doubt when you talk about players taking next steps and uh, answering the call, so to speak. As far as what the scheme is gonna look like here, it is that Blitzburg defense, the attacking 3-4 type of uh, uh, style of defense where you're going to really get after the quarterback with five-man rushes, really lean into stunts where you're asking uh, disruptive defensive tackles to uh, distract and blow up the communication of the guard and the center, or sometimes the center and the guard, and then wrap and bend around whether it's blitzing linebackers or edge linebackers guys like tj watt alex highsmith really creative attacking front that often leans into five-man rushes and that puts a lot of pressure on the secondary and the back end you, you typically want to see these guys get in receivers faces and press coverage but it also just requires a lot of communication if you're going with like a cover three hot blitz 
it's cover three that turns into cover one or some form of man coverage almost immediately. So not only does that require athletes on the back end, um, but it requires a lot of communication as well. So you'll see a healthy combination of, of those styles of blitzes. And then when they aren't blitzing, they'll mix in pretty much anything and everything that they feel uh, their players can run the best. So uh, it's, it's a scheme that they're comfortable with here in Pittsburgh. It's what they breathe, eat, sleep, die. They are always towards the, the top of the league in, in blitz percentage, and it's, it's not going to look any different <laughs> this year. Then you go to the offensive side of the ball, Matt Canada in year two is the offensive coordinator here. And I think we're still honestly learning a lot about Matt Canada. They hire him straight out of the college ranks. He had been anywhere and everywhere in Midwestern college football for the most part, whether it was Wisconsin or Northern Iowa or Maryland or Indiana. Uh, you name it, he he was coaching <laughs> in in the college ranks. They hire him because with Big Ben there, you know, they really wanted to run a quick college style spread offense. They basically acted like a, a college that doesn't have a quarterback that can push the ball downfield would and just, you know, horizontal passing game, spread offense, get that ball out quickly, let the receivers do the work. And Matt Canada um, you know, this offense wasn't pretty to watch, but I, I really wouldn't pin that on Matt Canada in his play calling. So I think he's uh, well um, qualified to open up the offense a little bit. They clearly like what they see in him and I trust the Steelers, but there's also a lot to be proved there from Matt Canada. I rank him and the Steelers 20th in pass game coaching. I think he's a little bit stronger on that side of the ball and 29th in run game coaching where it is a pretty stale run game. So uh, definitely some to prove there, but I also don't look at Matt Canada and feel like he's got to go or anything like that. So obviously a very good staff and excellent culture that are going to generate some benefit of the doubt as we now dive into this roster, at least on the defensive side of the ball. But we are going to start on offense where we get to talk about this quarterback situation that is fascinating to me because it is a true quarterback competition right now to me between Mitch Trubisky, who they bring in from Buffalo after a rehab year after flaming out in Chicago, and Kenny Pickett, a new first round quarterback selection. And I'm going to start with Kenny Pickett because it is my opinion that he wins this job. I just think he is the better quarterback, especially especially for a team that wants to play defense and just kind of let these playmakers do the work. I do think Kenny Pickett is, even though he's a rookie, going to come in and as soon as he understands the playbook, which shouldn't be too big of an issue for him, I think he's going to do a better job operating uh, operating the rhythm of this offense and just doing what they ask the quarterback to do, even if Mitch Trubisky has tools and physical traits that Kenny Pickett doesn't have. And Kenny Pickett, to me, uh, he was my QB1. I, I don't have a problem with them picking him 20th in the draft. This is not a Steelers team that's going to have a lot of swings at you know, top quarterback prospects, potentially elite guys. That's why the Trubisky signing is a fun little move for them just to get those physical tools in the building. But it's it's kind of like a neutered version of when the Patriots took Mac Jones last year where, no, he doesn't have this crazy upside, but I do think he's a functional player and, and can provide you starting quarterback play for cheap on that rookie contract and maybe buy you time to see if a Mitch Trubisky can develop or take a third round dart throw one of these years on a higher upside guy, whether it's like a Malik Willis or something like that down the road, that type of deal. But for now, I, I think Kenny Pickett was a solid move. I actually liked the draft pick a lot more than a lot of people. And again, I think he does win this job. So his evaluation was interesting, but also fairly simple. I think he kind of is what he is. I think when you want to talk about a quarterback being able to play from the pocket, get through his progressions, operate the, the rhythm and timing of the offense. He's able to do that with pretty good processing, with pretty good accuracy from the pocket, and it's, it should only get better in time. The one thing with Kenny Pickett, though, that really bothers you is after about two, two and a half seconds, he's going to run. He is not a, a full-on first read quarterback because you'll see him get that head around to his second read and get through his progressions, but he does have a clock in the back of his head where he's like, 
okay, the pass rush is coming and it's going to get to me and I got to go. And he's good outside of structure. He's really instinctive as far as kind of, um, he doesn't have a great arm, which I'll talk about, but he does have just kind of natural balance in his throwing ability on the run and good accuracy when throwing on the run. So that paired with good field vision when he's on the move and good athleticism, he's going to make some plays out of structure and, and certainly more than Big Ben was able to do for them last year and the last couple of years. So it, it's a nice addition there, but it is also kind of a detractor from him as far as his upside as a passer because he doesn't have that natural poise in the pocket. The elite quarterbacks, for the most part, they're comfortable hanging in the pocket until they no longer have to. Whereas Kenny Pickett, it's like, yeah, I'll play from the pocket, but I'm going to get out and move and use my athleticism uh, if I don't like what I see pretty quickly. And when you do that, you're just going to leave a lot of meat on the bones of a lot of passing plays, whether it's not looking at that backside post or the backside dig or a receiver does come open later in the play, you're just gonna miss stuff like that. And when you start scrambling, you cut the field in half. Whereas when you're playing from the pocket, if you get the protection for it, uh, you have the full field to survey. So again, that just cuts his ceiling in half. Potentially he could work on that and, and weed that out of his game. That's one area that I really do believe, sometimes it gets worse when you play behind bad pass protection, but I don't typically see that get better at the next level as far as actually being comfortable inside the pocket. It might be possible, but I definitely think that's unlikely. He's also a little bit limited in his arm talent. I don't think he's got a noodle, but it's just it's just an average NFL arm. He he can make throws down the field, but you're not going to be seeing, you know, what these top quarterbacks are doing and dropping dimes way way down the field consistently at the next level. So that that sort of um available field in the passing game is, is going to be shrunk compared to some of the elite quarterbacks. But for the most part, I do think a solid quarterback prospect. He was my QB one. So it was fun to see him come off the board, you know, kind of around where I would have taken him. I, I honestly think if I'm the Steelers, that might've even been the pick I actually made either him or Malik Willis swing for the upside. But I, I can see a path where they're a playoff team this year with Kenny Pickett. A guy like Malik Willis and Mitch Trubisky, you don't really have that floor, so I understand the process. And then you got Mitch Trubisky, who I'm not going to write off as being the day one starter for this team. And I'm all for second opportunities. It's third opportunities and fourth opportunities where I can start to question things a little bit more. But for what they paid for Trubisky, for what the opportunity is, where he's coming in here to compete and really prove that something clicked in Buffalo... I'm all for it, and I'm at least fascinated if he wins the week one job to see what he can do, because to me that says he did enough in Buffalo where that staff is incredible at quarterback development. What they did with Josh Allen, and I was a Josh Allen guy coming out, but what they've been able to do with his mechanics and his ability to play in structure it's maybe unprecedented. So if Mitch Trubisky absorbed at least some of that coaching and absorbed some tendencies from Josh Allen and then comes to Pittsburgh and impresses this staff enough with his work ethic and attention to detail and uh, wins this starting job, I'm at least intrigued to see what he looks like week one because he does have all the tools. He's insanely athletic. He's probably one of the five to 10 best running quarterbacks in the league just as a ball carrier. He's super underrated in that aspect. He has an underrated arm as well. You know, he was inaccurate throwing the deep ball and he, he can't throw to his left was, was always a big criticism on Trubisky. So you hope those mechanics are improving, but the arm talent was never a, never a question. It's just how much uh, he's able to get from his mechanics and his core and his footwork that did sometimes hold back his ability to make those big time throws because it is it is the whole package if you want to consistently throw the deep ball. Um, so there's a lot obviously that he needed needs to work on and I love that he's not their only answer, but if he wins this job, I'm at least intrigued to see what he can look like. 
And I do think that's an endorsement of him showing some development. That said, his leash is going to be incredibly short, like maybe one half of football short because they did spend a first round pick on Kenny Pickett and Pickett is going to be scratching and clawing for that job as well. So I do think Kenny Pickett wins it, but will not be surprised if we see Trubisky for a week or two. My bet would be he didn't develop. He still missed Trubisky. You're going to get two or three weeks of them, and they're going to go to Kenny Pickett at some point here. But again, the intrigue is there. Uh, also, rest in peace, Dwayne Haskins. I wish we could get an opportunity to talk about here, him here. Uh, obviously, tragically died over this, this offseason. So, um, unfortunately, Mason Rudolph is QB3 here. We'll see if, if Rudolph even makes the team. Uh, Man, I just, I'm done talking about Mason Rudolph. I, let's just move on. They draft Chris Oladukin as well. He's an athlete in the seventh round. We'll, we'll see if he, he makes it as well. So they rank 27th for me at quarterback. And, you know, it's because I think Kenny Pickett is going to give them a decent floor. And Trubisky's intriguing at least. But if, if Trubisky was the starter, they would, they would be ranking uh, probably last in the NFL. At least, you know, week one, week two, until he gets benched and they go to Kenny Pickett. Uh, but let's move on and talk about the wide receiver room here, which it, it's a much more pos uh, positive outlook. I, I really like this wide receiver core, and I flirted with even ranking them higher just after watching this team back because Deontay Johnson is so, so freaking good, man. He is not acknowledged enough as one of the premium separators in the NFL, and I've watched a lot of Packers football. I've watched a lot of Keenan Allen. I've watched a lot of Stefan Diggs and Amari Cooper. I'm sorry, but Deontay Johnson is right there with all of those guys as far as his ability to get open like that within the first second or two of the play. And that's a massive weapon and a massive uh, just resource for a young quarterback especially a guy that likes to bail from the pocket early, to have a first read like Deontay Johnson that's almost always open, that's so valuable. And the one thing with Deontay Johnson that holds him back is those freaking drops, man. He might have one of the worst pairs of hands in the league. A lot of times he turns his head upfield too soon, or he just straight up drops it when he's looking at the ball. If he hits the jugs machine, Deontay Johnson can be one of the best receivers in the NFL because his ability to get open is spectacular and he will make some impressive catches as well it's just the concentration and the consistency with his hands that is holding him back but ah, man i was i fell back in love with deontay johnson when i was going back to watch some all 22 for the steelers because i i did love him coming out and, and that was one of my better draft calls of that year was that they would replace uh antonio brown with deontay johnson specifically uh, using the very pick that they got for Antonio Brown. And uh, unfortunately, his hands haven't been there to become that level of player, but I think his potential is is there. And in a contract year, if he hits those jugs machine, he could be a true difference maker for this team. So it starts there, but it doesn't end there. You have Chase Claypool, who's a, a just dream compliment to a Deontay Johnson. And, and I should rewind just a second because there is some contract uh, stuff going on with Deontay Johnson. He, he wants to be paid here. I saw he wants to be paid like top dollar. And I think the Steelers have all the leverage in the world to say, look, Deontay, we have no problem paying you that if you come out and improve your hands and go for 1500 yards this year and, and prove that you're worth it. So I, I think it's all in front of Deontay from that perspective. And I, I do think he plays. There's no holdout or a trade or anything like that. Uh, but with Chase Claypool, like I said, the premium compliment to a Deontay Johnson, big bodied, go get it perimeter receiver, which is like the opposite of Deontay Johnson. But Claypool has legit speed to stack on the outside. The one thing is he's had Big Ben. He's going to have Kenny Pickett here now, who I think will be a better deep ball thrower than Big Ben. But, you know, Chase Claypool would be at his best if used like DK Metcalf with like Russell Wilson or something where you can just let him go on a, a small route tree where he's working in straight lines and can outrun and out physical guys down the field. So he is a poor man's DK Metcalf. It's a, it's a great comparison for Chase Claypool and the flashes as a rookie, like it looked like he was going to be that type of player, but year two was disappointing. So I, I do think 
it's still stock up for Claypool. This just was not a passing game that was conducive to a whole lot of production and development from these receivers. Uh, so I still like Chase Claypool quite a lot. And I think we see more from him here in year three. And then they draft George Pickens. And the Steelers just have such a great eye for these receivers. Every time they draft a guy, you need to kind of, you know, peek over and be like, oh, oh, Steelers like him. Okay, look out. Because it was Deontay Johnson, it was Juju Smith-Schuster, Antonio Brown, Emmanuel Sanders, Chase, uh, did I say Chase Claypool? Uh, now George Pickens, like, when the Steelers draft a receiver in the second and third round, he hits. And I already liked George Pickens as someone that, if he played his full final season, probably gets into the mix with that, you know, wide receiver one conversation, honestly, with, with guys like... Uh, Olave and, and Wilson and Williams and all, all these guys, I, I do think George Pickens, if he played and had the right quarterback play like those guys did, you would have seen him prove to be that true X wide receiver and someone worthy of a first round pick. He doesn't play. Uh, there's reported off field questions with him. Nothing new for the Steelers. They they kind of like their head cases at wide receiver, and they don't have any issue with that. I'm not I'm not saying George Pickens is a head case. I have no idea where those reports came from. I don't know anything about it, but that is supposedly why he may have fallen a little bit in the draft. Just a heads up on that. Um, I I think he's going to be a stud. Is he going to produce at a crazy level as a rookie? I you know I I said no on Chase Claypool. I said no on Juju. So I wouldn't be stunned, but. There's only so many targets to go around here. I, I do think when he plays, he's going to be a good perimeter receiver because Deontay will play in the slot in 11 personnel quite a bit. So he can win on the outside. He's a great run blocker uh, and he will be an asset for this team. Who I think it's better as the year goes on. I just, you know, if you want to talk about fantasy football, I don't know if it's all going to be there in year one. And if they do end up letting Deontay Johnson go and they really like what they see from George Pickens, you might have a bit of a seamless replacement to still have a damn good receiving core here, even if you have to lose Deontay Johnson. So really like the three wide receivers there, but all three of them kind of in their own right have a little bit to prove, I would say. Uh, the depth at wide receiver, they signed Miles Boykin, blocking specialist for sure. I will say like, <sighs> Steelers fans will like this at least. The Ravens are not an offense designed to let wide receivers thrive. They just aren't. They run the ball a crap ton. They focus on passing over the middle of the field. And let's face it, Lamar is not a great, accurate passer deep and outside the numbers. So a guy like Miles Boykin, who's kind of just a uh, go get it, deep ball guy, work the sidelines. It's just, it's never gonna be there in, in Baltimore. So he gets claimed here and I just, I will say, keep an eye on Miles Boykin. The opportunity is not really going to be there, but I think he can still have a good career ahead of him. This guy's a great athlete who looked pretty good as a rookie, uh, who just never really produced beyond that. And then they draft Calvin Austin in the mid rounds and another really interesting Steelers pick. And I look at a player they lost last year who actually played like 500 snaps for them in Ray Ray McLeod. And I'm all of a sudden reminded like, oh yeah, that makes a ton of sense. He's their Ray Ray McLeod. I I really like Calvin Austin. I think as that sort of gimmick player like a Ray Ray McLeod, he can plug in seamlessly as a fourth wide receiver, someone that they will kind of rotate in and out certain play calls, certain packages, just to kind of keep the defense on it. Um, but Calvin also has a really... Uh, functional skill set as a deep receiver. He is short. He's only 5'7", I believe. But his release package, his hands, and his ball tracking ability deep down the field, paired, of course, with his legit 4'3 speed, it's real. So the opportunity, again, for him to play that role isn't really going to be there. But I think he can be used creatively in, in you know, maybe 200 snaps or so, uh, be that kind of gimmick threat and just kind of hang around here and, and maybe eventually earn an opportunity. But uh, just to kind of why not pick at that point to provide even more wide receiver depth. Beyond those five, you got Gunnar Olszewski, who can be a return man and compete in that role with Calvin Austin. Uh, but, you know, a wide receiver six type, along with Anthony Miller, uh, who I have an inside source, just says the dude is like a coach's nightmare, just doesn't know the playbook and doesn't really want it 
Really talented dude, second round pick for the Bears years ago. Knows Mitch Trubisky, but uh, that's about the only thing he's got working for him right now. Uh, Steven Sims has started games in the slot for Washington. Uh, Tyler Vaughn, Tyler Sneed, Cody White, I guess maybe have a chance, but uh, that wide receiver six spot's going to have a hard time seeing the field either way. Then at tight end, Pat Fryermuth, breakout rookie season. And I was trying to tell you guys, for those that follow the draft analysis, this dude's a first round player. Jags fans hated me when I mocked them Pat Fryermuth like every single mock draft at like the 25th pick when they ended up taking Travis Etienne. He was overshadowed by Kyle Pitts, who's maybe the best tight end prospect we've ever seen. But I mean, Fryermuth's the whole package. He had every sign that he was capable of this right away battled some injuries and bad quarterback play in his final year at Penn State, but the size is there. The athleticism, absolutely there. The hands, the toughness after the catch, the blocking. It's its all there with Pat Fryermuth. that always has been, and he was a total steal when they got him in the second round. He comes in, Ebron gets hurt, and Pat Fryermuth never looked back. He got better as the year went on. So he's trending up. I fully believe Pat Fryermuth can ascend to that level of, of maybe someday getting in conversations with someone like Mark Andrews in this division when we debate, like, who's the best tight end in football. I do think that highly of Pat Fryermuth obviously has a long ways to go and is going to need a situation conducive to his success like Mark Andrews has had in Baltimore. But, man, there's nothing he can't do. There's, there's no ceiling he can't reach. And his floor is pretty damn good right now, too. So a, a true stock up player in Pat Fryermuth. Behind him, you're definitely not excited. You have Zach Gentry, who's just kind of a big body, almost space eater of a tight end. Throws his body around as a blocker. A six foot eight target with strong hands, but nothing you're excited about. Behind him, they draft Connor Hayward, who's going to be kind of an H-back, fullback, hybrid type. Uh, Steelers fans are saying they're going to keep him and Derek Watt, which is interesting because I see them both as fullback types. But uh, Hayward is Casey Hayward, uh, not Casey Hayward. He's um, Cam Hayward's brother, who's obviously a star defensive tackle for this team. Kevin Rader got on the field last year, not much there. And then Jay Sternberger, uh, if he can put it together off the field, he also has a lot of physical talent. So I guess keep an eye there, but probably nothing beyond Pat Fryermuth. And then at running back, it's Najee Harris or Bust. And I do believe Najee got the most snaps out of any running back last year. Had over a thousand. And I don't think any back had over a thousand snaps last year. So uh, you obviously hope he can hold up with that much workload. But um, he is so big that I'm not terribly worried about it, at least as he's young here. So you're less worried about the depth uh, than you would be elsewhere because he is kind of that classic bell cow full on back. You just don't see that a ton these days. Najee Harris is that. Uh, so when he's out there, he is just so hard to bring down in space and he's more fluid as a route runner as you'd expect. He has good hands. He had his ups and downs as a pass catcher last year, but I definitely think he he can continue to to get better and, and become one of the best just full-on three down backs in the league i think he's already getting there so uh he's definitely a weapon especially on check downs and screens which with everything else going around him like he doesn't need to be some down the field running back threat either so he's a good pass protector as well and definitely a weapon behind him not a whole lot worth talking about you got benny snell who i cannot believe they are going with as their backup running back again one of the least explosive backs i've had to watch get significant playing time in in recent memory so i'll just leave it at that uh he's not good especially as a receiving back anthony mcfarland you hope can take that next step up was so promising coming out of maryland super explosive dude but in two years it hasn't been there and i want to see it I know it's in there somewhere, but he's he's got to work at it and get that out of him. And then, man, Trey Edmonds, Jalen Warren, Mateo Durant. Seriously, it is it is Najee Harris or bust. And if something happened to Harris, this team's going to have to make a move because, you know, running backs don't matter and all that stuff. But it does matter when you got to go to Benny Snell and Trey Edmonds. So 
Uh, I like Harris, and that's it with the running backs. Overall, you end up with the 15th group of weapons and absolutely a group that I can see becoming a top 10 group within the year if the quarterback play is right and the work ethic is there with guys like Claypool. I mean, really everybody. Like if everybody develops here, it's gonna be one of the best groups of weapons in the entire league. The depth and physical talent is entirely there. Uh, but let's move on and talk about this offensive line. Uh, and if an interesting motley crew of, of linemen here and the Steelers have always earned the benefit of the doubt with, with the offensive line. And uh, we tried to give it to them last year. And, and in some respects, like they functioned. But a large part of that is they just got the ball out so quickly that we honestly, with a lot of these guys, we didn't get a full understanding of how much they could hold up in the drop back passing game. But there's certainly times where they didn't. And we knew that was going to happen. And the players here aren't too different. So I am certainly worried about this offensive line despite the Steelers being a team that earned that benefit of the doubt. They rank 26th for me in pass blocking, and even worse, 30th for run blocking, which we'll revisit all of this from a run blocking perspective. Right now, we're just previewing the passing game. So from a pass block perspective, at left tackle, you have Dan Moore in year two, Definitely a player that got better as the year went on, was stunned to see him earn a starting role. I thought he was a day three tackle prospect and for him to be trotted out at left tackle, uh, the Steelers clearly saw something in him. They clearly like his mentality and work ethic to continue getting better, but it certainly was not um, perfect as, as a rookie and just all of it needs to improve there. Uh, certainly going to get some benefit of the, of the doubt with him, but I just don't know if he's got the talent to become that sort of franchise left tackle type of dude, and, and he certainly could be a problem for them. You're not worried about Kevin Dotson at left guard. He's been a rock since the second he came into the league. He is a player that I was stunned was starting in his rookie season, but was just super good from the get-go. And then you get to the center position, and, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell the Steelers what to do. It's the Pittsburgh Steelers. They know a thing or two about offensive line, but I feel like they have a little bit of an identity crisis with this center position and even a little bit of the right guard spot here because the Steelers at their heart, like they're an inside zone blocking scheme and they also want to run power. They have Najee Harris, like they're a between the tackles run game. And, and I know we're talking about the passing game here, but it all applies when you talk about like a wide zone center fit. We talk a lot about these lighter athletes at center can play in a wide zone scheme much better because a lot of times it's play action, it's moving pockets, and you're not asked to just set set your feet and anchor in those offenses like you are a lot more of the time here with the Pittsburgh Steelers. So they bring in Mason Cole from Minnesota, who, had, who is a lighter guy, 295 pounds, had his best year for the Vikings last year. You have Kendrick Green who I liked coming out, but I really liked as a wide zone scheme fit because he's a lighter dude, a great athlete, but not much of an anchor. JC Hassenauer actually played okay for them last year, but again, 295 pounds, six foot two. Like, shouldn't they go out and get themselves like a big bodied 315 pound center that can maul dudes and run the scheme that they want to run? It just, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Um, so I'm worried about that spot and I think they are probably a little bit worried about it because right now Mason Cole is listed as their starter. We'll see if he ends up winning that job. I think it's pretty much a push, especially in pass protection between all these guys. I think Hassenauer is the one that's played the best in, in pass pro in his NFL career. Kendrick Green's the one with the potential and Mason Cole's probably the best run blocker of the three, but possibly the worst pass protector. So whoever ends up winning that job. Uh, they'll protect him with double teams and stuff, but one-on-one, -on -one, any of these guys are going to be a liability. Then you get to right guard, James Daniels. I, I like James Daniels. Again, I think he's better in a wide zone scheme fit, and that's why I was surprised Chicago let him go, but he at least is a little bit more rocked up with a better anchor uh, with, with really good core balance and stuff. So I'm, I'm definitely not worried about James Daniels. I like that signing, and he might even have his best football ahead of him here being coached by the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then at right tackle, Chukuma Okorafor, I can't believe they gave him a $30 million contract. And he certainly has not played like that. He's played just like an adequate starting caliber right tackle. And 
he's one of the lower ranking starting caliber tackles in the league. I think he's fine. But when I look at like, for example, inner division, the Baltimore Ravens signed Morgan Moses for literally half three years, 15 mil of what the Steelers paid Okora for. Like make that make sense. Okora for is making almost as much as Jack Conklin on the Browns. So he's fine. He's nothing more than that. And I think last year was supposed to be the year that like he took this big step and was this lockdown tackle because he was a third round pick with some physical tools. But his development just has been it's been there, but it has not been immense. He's just gotten incrementally better every year. And I don't expect that to really change. So, man, it's it's just not a good pass protecting offensive line. As far as the depth goes, Joe Hag is is definitely adequate depth. He's probably a better left tackle than Dan Moore is right now, but they're hoping Dan Moore takes that big step. Trent Scott, Chaz Green, you don't want these guys to see in the field. It's been ugly when they have for their respective teams in years past. The one guy I definitely have my eye on is Jordan Tucker. He was actually on my My Guys list, and when I was doing my tackle evals, getting 40 deep, you know, you watch tackles 30 through 40, they all kind of look the same, and they all suck. But I was watching Jordan Tucker, and he was kind of locked down, man. And he handled Jermaine Johnson, and then I was like, I'm going to do another game. And again, still pretty solid. So uh, I like Jordan Tucker, big body dude who totally fits this scheme. We'll see if he makes the team first. But just someone to keep an eye on, an undrafted tackle. The odds are against him for sure. But a player I did like and had a draftable grade on and was kind of a completely like diamond in the rough type of prospect. Uh, obviously was was not drafted so and I didn't expect him to get drafted then you get to the interior we mentioned some of this depth Kendrick Green JC Hassenauer they're going to compete at center and all these guys have guard center flexibility as depth those guys are are pretty good so at least there's that uh, John Leglu played a little bit last year he's fine so you'll probably go with those three as your your depth on the inside and that'll probably be the end of that but again it's not a good pass protecting offensive line. They rank 26th. They'll probably do a lot of the same stuff where they're going to get the ball out quick and, and not ask these guys to hold up too long. But without, you know, sitting duck Big Ben where he basically had to make a quick decision and get the ball out. Now you have quarterbacks that can push the ball downfield a little better, that can improvise, and, and you're going to want to give them better pass pro. So it, it's definitely when I look at this offense, something that's that's going to hold this team back. They they rank 26th for, for passing game, which is honestly a little better than they were last year, but not by much. It's going to come down to the defense and the run game here, but let's, let's talk about that run game before we get into the uh, defense. And they ranked 23rd for me in run games. So a little bit better, but definitely some problems. And that starts with the offensive line. We kind of tore these guys to shred as pass protectors, but they're maybe even worse as run blockers, at least stacked up against the rest of the league. You know, Dan Moore just is not a strong dude. He's not a great athlete. I, I think he can definitely get better in pass pro, but as a run blocker, I just don't know how much it's ever going to be there. Maybe he surprises me. Kevin Dotson as well is just slow out of his stance. He struggles to get leverage and positioning uh, and to generate some of that drive early on in the snap. So he's an anchor in pass pro, but run blocking is, has not been a strength for him. When you get to the centers, like I think these guys are fine as run blockers, but in wide zone scheme fits, again, like an identity crisis here. If you're asking Mason Cole at 295 pounds or Kendrick Green or JC Hassenauer, all these guys are super light. If you're asking them to come out and drive a nose tackle on inside zone or down block a nose tackle on power, I'm worried about that. That's like a serious problem that was a problem for them last year and is a major reason this is one of the worst run blocking units in the league. Like they don't, they run a scheme that demands um, pushing guys in the middle of the field backwards and they don't have a center that can do it. So it's just, it's just weird to me. Uh, James Daniels, I, I think is, is going to be their best run blocker. Uh, he does fire out of his stance. He does have good play strength, even though he's a great athlete and a good wide zone fit. I, I don't worry about him running power, pulling and pinning and all that stuff. Uh, not worried about that. And then a core for at right tackle just continues to be like balanced, adequate, decent technique, decent athlete, decent size, decent strength, but just no no true standout traits in any regard 
And as far as the depth, there's no one coming in that you're like, oh yeah, they got better there because of an injury. So it's just, there's not gonna be a lot of lanes for Najee Harris. Um, there weren't last year. And that's well reflected in my my running back rankings here. I, I ranked them eighth. They'd be seventh if they had just a baseline backup because I think Benny Stale is that bad uh, and he will get out there occasionally. Uh, but dude, I, I freaking love Najee Harris. And I think he is already one of the better running backs in the league. There's, there's some top heavy guys, but with some of those guys getting up there in age, I think we'll feel pretty comfortable saying Najee Harris is a top five running back maybe not this year, but before too long. And, you know, you might've watched him play last year and be like, yeah, he's, he looks really good, but I don't think he's a top five to 10 running back. And and that's fine. He only had 3.9 yards per attempt, but he was always getting touched, like right at the line of scrimmage almost every single time. Najee Harris was tied for third in the league in missed tackles forced last year. He still had over 1,200 yards. Like, he was creating offense for the Steelers last year. And it's because he's got vision. He's got a jump cut to change lanes when that first lane is shut down. He's got power to fight for those tough yardage. And of course, the size and, and good explosiveness for, for what he is. I, I love Najee Harris. And um, he's going to make this a competent run game. He's basically the only reason they rank 23rd in the NFL for run game because the run blocking ranks 30th, the run game coaching ranks 29th. I don't see a whole lot of innovation here from Matt Canada and don't expect it this year. Maybe a little bit of a QB run multiplier with guys like Trubisky and Kenny Pickett for sure. But uh, dude, Najee's a, a, an absolute monster. And maybe I rank him in this running back room a little higher than people expect, but dude, he's, he's incredible. So I already think he's a star running back. But again, I, I wish they had even just like put Melvin Gordon next to him or Sony Michelle or like someone that can be a guy that can get five carries a game and not be the least on a and on a, or not be the least athletic running back out there like possible. Benny Snell to me, I said it two years ago. I was like, dude, why is he getting all these carries? He's got no vision. He's got no explosiveness. He doesn't use his size to consistently run guys over. I, I genuinely do not get it. I don't think he would be on most teams in the league, let alone their backup. So that's crazy to me. And they don't have anybody else. Anthony McFarlane has intrigue as a receiving back, but as a runner, maybe in a wide zone scheme fit would look better, but uh, no power or vision at all. Trey Edmonds has been kind of just like a special teamer. And uh, you got a couple undrafted free agents there that I don't expect anything from. So the depth is a joke, but you got Najee and Najee's Najee. As far as the rest of the skill player blocking and their contributions, it's certainly nothing special. Uh, you have a group of receivers that I, I just don't see any of these guys as standout run blockers other than Miles Boykin, who when he's on the field is maybe top three run blocker at receiver in the league. George Pickens was good at it at Georgia as well. So I think you're replacing some of that physicality as, as a run blocker that you had uh, in Juju, who's a really good run blocker as well. Um, and then at tight end, Pat Fryermuth, I actually was a little bit disappointed in, in his ability to sustain blocks as a rookie. I think there's definitely room for growth based on his strength and athleticism and physicality. I, I think they can get more out of him this year, but uh, wasn't great in his rookie year. Zach Gentry's a, a solid guy who uses those lengths, uh, uses that length that's six foot eight to just kind of latch on and, and run his feet. So he's fine. Uh, you do have Derek Watt, who really took a step up last year as a mauling fullback. Uh, I think really kind of figured a lot of stuff out. And then they also draft Connor Hayward, who has been kind of just like a fullback, wingback type. And I'm cu very curious to see both how they utilize him. Do they keep him and Derek Watt? And then beyond that, how good is he going to be as a blocker at the next level? But he's definitely an interesting pick that could improve the skill player blocking here that right now is just not anything special. So again, the run game ranking 23rd, which is basically all Najee Harris. They do rank tied for 12th from that QB multiplier as well, because both Trubisky and Pickett are very good run threats. So that is something that'll, that'll play a factor. 
Matt Canada, a former college coach, is, is definitely not going to be afraid to lean into the read option. He, he obviously didn't do that with Big Ben, but it, it could become an interesting weapon for this, this run game that we got to keep an eye on. So overall, 26th for total offense. And they better hope they're 26th because if they get any worse than that, if these quarterbacks are worse than I'm projecting, if Najee goes down, like they're going to have a hard time moving the ball with this offensive line and, and some young quarterbacks. But uh, I do like the playmakers quite a bit. Let's move on, though, where it's going to get much, much more optimistic with this defense that uh, I'll just lead off with this. They're going to rank second in the NFL for overall defense. And it's what got them in the playoffs last year. And it's what is going to give them a chance at doing it again this year and, and giving them a chance to at least sustain Mike Tomlin's uh, record of, of never having a losing season. Uh, and of course, we already talked about the staff and, and why that's a major reason for it. But there's some pretty serious talent on this team as well. Uh, so let's start with the pass defense, which is going to rank fifth, leading off with the pass rush that to me is the third best pass rush in the NFL. And that, of course, is because you've got TJ Watt uh, to kick this whole thing off with the pass rush. They've got other pieces here that we'll talk about, but, you know, you've got the defensive player of the year there. Now, I'm going to tick Steelers fans off just a little bit. I... He would not have been my vote. It still would have been Aaron Donald. I think there are better edge rushers in the league. Uh, there might be one in this division. But, um, you know, he was not the most productive pass rusher in the league last year. Yes, he broke the sack record, but a lot of that was cleanup stuff. A lot of it was unblocked stuff. A lot of it was um, stuff that they schemed him up with his unique skill set where he's able to bend and wrap around and stunt and stuff. But... Um, I'm just going to say it, man. I think there are better edge rushers in the league, and Steelers fans are going to bully you into saying he's the best pass rushing, at least edge rusher in the league, and I don't think so. But he is an elite presence. I'm not, like, opposed to him winning Defensive Player of the Year. I just would have voted for Aaron Donald because he's a better defensive player and was more productive last year. I don't just look at sacks. Um, now, TJ Watt does a lot of stuff as well as far as deflecting passes and making splash plays in the run and dropping into coverage like I get it I do I'm ranking them third for pass rush I'm not sleeping on TJ Watt I'm just not going to be bullied into saying he's the best edge rusher in the league because I don't believe that but getting an elite grade from me on the edge he amplifies everything here and of course he's productive in his own right uh, his just kind of dip and rip move and his bend and get off acceleration that's that's where he dominates, man. And and a lot of tackles just don't know how to handle it. Like they genuinely can't get the depth. And then you start seeing teams try to chip block him. And he's so natural at just kind of absorbing the contact from a chip block and uh, assessing the balance of the tackle. Because a lot of times a chip block can actually screw up the tackle and put you in a weird position. And TJ Watt is just so good at like identifying, okay, I got chipped, I'm gonna reset. The tackle is now leaning inside because he out, had outside chip help. So quick little, you know, jab, step, rip, and you're around the corner. You're bending and you're strip sacking the quarterback. So, like, I do think teams need to just stop chip blocking him. I don't think it's productive. Um, but, yeah, he he's incredible as a pass rusher. And they do so much creative stuff with him, too. You have these disruptive interior rushers. So you're able to, you know, slant the defensive tackle and then wrap TJ Watt around him unblocked. And you're able to uh, show him, like, you put him up there as that rush rush edge and teams are going to adjust their protections to block him because you want to double team TJ Watt. But he then drops into coverage and all of a sudden they forgot to block the blitzing middle linebacker on the other side. Like, he just, he, he fucks up everything for, <laughs> for offensive lines. So... Um, you know, you do have to take in, into all that account when I say he's not the best edge rusher in the league. Maybe his presence and everything that he does does make him the most valuable edge rusher in the league. I think you, you could make that argument, basically. But uh, it, it, let's move on beyond what you have in TJ Watt because I don't think they would rank third with just TJ Watt. But they've got really functional, good players next to him as well. 
and uh, Alex Highsmith on the other side is a baby version of TJ Watt. And, you know, that's a overused term, but it really is accurate with Alex Highsmith. He looks similar. He's got that kind of janky hybrid linebacker build where he's stocky, but he's so quick and bendy. Uh, and he wins in similar ways as well. Like he goes to that same rip move. Like TJ has clearly said, like, if you get this leverage, just do this, just dip and bend and you'll get home. But he also mixes in a spin move and an inside counter. Like he is super similar to TJ Watt. And what I really like about Alex Highsmith is he really, to me, added an element of power to his game last year, improved as a run defender, improved with the occasional ability to, to go to a bull rush. And um, it's, it's trending up, I do believe, with Alex Highsmith. And that just opens up the scheme even more because you can do that same stunt work that we mentioned with TJ Watt. You can do that on the other side with Alex Highsmith. And now you've got uh, Brian Flores coming in, who's like the ultimate hybrid linebacker coach. He's coming in and you're going to see them just do crazy shit with Alex Highsmith, TJ Watt, dropping into coverage one play, wrapping on a blitz the next, straight up rush the play after that. These guys are just such a chess piece nightmare for this defense and they're allowed to do that because they have such a good interior defensive line so you've got Cameron Hayward who is I would say a top 10 pass rushing defensive tackle overall a top three to five defensive tackle and he is just straight up a tough block he's a I would describe a good athlete with incredible raw strength but he has that raw strength at about 295 pounds so that allows him to stay light and quick and improve his get off where he can land his hands quickly and get to that bull rush but to have that raw strength whether it's in his core or his arms it just makes him powerful as a rusher while also remaining quick so he's a 60 pressure guy which is towards the top for defensive tackles he's great at um, contributing on these stunts where he can demand a double on the inside where he can stunt where he's he's enough of a presence where let's let's put it this way if if you put him as a three technique uh, as a shade of the guard and you have high smith or tj watt as an edge hayward is enough of a presence where if you slant him outside the guard is going to follow him because you don't want to let Cam Hayward go unblocked and you don't want to risk that the tackle doesn't see him slant. But then, whoops, Alex Highsmith just ran right past my face. Like, that is that is at the core. Like, I mean, they do a lot of great stuff, but that is a huge part of what makes the Steelers so freaking lethal is, is the threat of Cam Hayward. So um, he's, he's a force multiplier. And then I love the Larry Ogunjobi signing next to him. You, you got to remember, they didn't have Stefan to it last year. So... He, they were looking forward to having him back where they actually were the number one pass rush for me with Stefan Tuitt because Tuitt's a special pass rusher. So it is a loss, but, um, you know, it's it's still upgraded from what they had last year because they didn't have Stefan Tuitt last year. So Larry Ogunjobi, I think, is overrated. I, I think the, the Bears giving him $40 million was just ridiculous. Like, he's a good pass rusher. He's a good signing here for the Steelers. He's an upgrade from what they had last year, but um, he's not Stefan Tuitt, right? But uh, to have him as just a, a quick guy on the inside, uh, someone that is a productive pass rusher, he is going to be in a perfect situation here because he doesn't have to play run defense. You've got Tyson Alu Aluolo. You've got Chris Wormley. You don't have to worry about Larry, Larry Ogunjobi holding up against the run because that's just not something he's capable of. But he's quick. He's got some power. He's a pretty damn solid number two defensive tackle for the Steelers here. So a nice signing. As far as the depth goes, um, on the edge, Derek Tuzka is rotational depth, late round pick, lack of athletic upside. I am keeping an eye on Gennard Avery. As a rookie, he was a 40 pressure guy for the Cleveland Browns. And then the Eagles went and traded for him. And he just, he didn't have a role in their more kind of simplified 4-3 defense. But he's a kind of hybrid linebacker type. And we've already talked about all of the different creative ways they use these linebackers. He's like a Brian Flores sort of dream type of player. 
just a, a six foot, 250 pound, uh, just loaded missile really is what he is. So when put in a scheme that knows how to deploy that talent, if they, if, if one of these edge guys goes down, keep an eye on Gennard Avery to have kind of a bounce back slash breakout year uh, in a scheme that fits his skill set really well. Great job by his agent to suggest the Steelers uh, as a good scheme fit because I couldn't agree more. Beyond that, no one on the edge I'm excited about. Uh, on the interior, Tyson Alualu can have some push, but he's going to be more of an early down guy at 35 years old. Chris Wormley was the Stefan Tuitt plug-in last year, and he was also pretty solid. So between Larry Ogunjobi and Wormley, you've got guys that can play. Uh, and then Montrevis Adams as well ended up getting some pretty nice playing time at the end of last season. This guy was a third round pick for Green Bay. I want to say he was a former five star, uh, went to the SEC and his development track has definitely been slow, but you could see the get off and the juice that he has as a pass rusher. So uh, very inconsistent career and a small sample size last year. But uh, if he is what he was last year on a bigger scale, that's another uh, solid starter in the middle. Uh, and then they also draft a Marvin Leal, which who I just, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of his game. I had a third to a fourth round grade on him. They take him in the third round. He's like this hybrid defensive end type. Uh, but man, he makes a lot of sense here for the Pittsburgh Steelers, not just as far as their coaching and development on the D line, but he's not going to be asked to play a true four, three edge, which I don't think he's fast enough for. And he's obviously not going to be asked to play a whole lot like between the guards. I think when you look at base defense, put him as a four eye or head up on the tackle. I actually think on this defense, he has a good role there. And a player that he kind of reminded me of was Emmanuel Ogba. I didn't put it as my pro comp because that's pretty high praise at this point. But I, I hate to keep coming back to Brian Flores here, but look what he did with a guy like Emmanuel Ogba, who was just a kind of chess piece defensive end. DeMarvin Leal could be that for them. Probably not as a rookie. It's a crowded room, but certainly an interesting addition there as a third round guy and the perfect landing spot outside of maybe going to Miami for DeMarvin Leal. Uh, Isaiah Loudermilk's a, a comparable um, player as far as being that hybrid defensive end, but wasn't really good as a rookie and late round pick. Not crazy about him. And then you've even got more depth behind him. So Henry Mondo has had some splash plays as a pass rusher. You have Carlos Davis and his brother Khalil Davis, both really good athletes coming out of Nebraska. Uh, the development hasn't been there for them, but the, the upside is certainly there here for the Steelers. So one of the deeper interior defensive line groups in the league, and we'll, we'll revisit them even more when we talk about run defense. Uh, you get to the linebackers, an interesting duo here with Devin Bush and Miles Jack. And I do think Devin Bush is poised for a better year this year, was probably at his worst year last year, was pretty good as a rookie, ends up getting hurt in 2020, and then just wasn't back to that, that level in, that he was in 2019 last season. But, uh, you know, a, a fresh new year, new staff, I, I have higher expectations from him, at least from a coverage perspective, because he is so fast. And he does have those instincts, especially to man guys up out of the backfield. He's got a good mentor in Miles Jack next to him. So I, I do think he's a better player this year after a down year last year. Still definitely concerned about his size and his run defense. But uh, just from a coverage perspective, I think he's going to be better. But I'm also not buying him as like a star linebacker either. Uh, and then Miles Jack, I do really like this signing. Another guy that had a horribly down year last year, but we're just you know, a year or two removed from Miles Jack being the highest paid linebacker in the league, a top five guy and uh, just a freaky coverage linebacker. So uh, coming to Pittsburgh, if he stays healthy, I'm not going to be the least bit surprised if he at least resumes as a top 10 linebacker. And they, they went after him almost immediately after Jacksonville released him. So uh, I do like that signing. I think he's going to have better football here in Pittsburgh. Maybe that's a little bit too much benefit of the doubt, but this is a really athletic duo. Uh, I rank them 14th for linebacker coverage, and I think they can get back into the top 10. Uh, if both these guys kind of bounce back. As far as the depth, Robert Splane's a good backup to have, just not a great athlete. Buddy Johnson, a mid-round pick last year, so he's got to develop. Marcus Allen's kind of a safety linebacker hybrid. We'll see if he makes the team, along with Ulysses Gilbert, who's played decent in pinches 
They also draft Mark Robinson in the seventh round. So, okay depth. Then the secondary, I actually ended up liking the secondary a lot more the more and more I watched this team and the more I thought about this team. Because before I prepped this video, I, I was like, man, the Steelers don't have any corners, do they? And then I put this together and they do. They have three corners that are all solid starters. You've got Levi Wallace coming in, who I think is an upgrade from what they had in Joe Hayden last year, because Joe Hayden just couldn't move anymore. Levi Wallace, you know, they they wanted more in Buffalo than what Levi Wallace was, but he hasn't been a liability for Buffalo. He's a very solid number two corner. And then you have Akella Witherspoon, who has done nothing but play incredible football when he's been on the field the last two years. He gets on the field late for the 49ers in 2020, finished with an outstanding four or five game stretch. The Seahawks sign him, for some reason trade him to Pittsburgh, and then has a hard time staying healthy last year, uh, played nine games, but was their best corner and was had no issues in coverage, really was, I don't want to say lockdown, but he was damn good. So if he's healthy and, and they, they keep him around here, I think he's actually a stock up guy that they believe in for good reason. He was a raw prospect coming out, but has all of the length and speed and, and quickness that if paired with more technique and, and better zone IQ, like there's no reason he can't be a good starting corner for them. So I actually look at that duo and, and it's better than, than I thought I was going to think about these guys coming in. And Cameron Sutton popped to me re-watching the Steelers. He certainly had his weeks where teams were, were picking on him a little bit. He's not the fastest dude, so I don't think he's ever going to be some lockdown corner. And that's why he's more of a slot guy. Uh, but they had, they had to ask him to play outside and he held up. To me, he shows a ton of toughness and a lot of zone IQ. He's a really quick dude. He's a former third round pick, so he's not some slouch of an athlete. He does have really nice quickness. It's just that long speed, but in the slot, you can protect that. So uh, I actually think being asked to be a full on slot corner for them with a more stable perimeter corner duo there, you could actually see a, a breakout year from Cam Sutton uh, now heading into a contract year. And you also got to keep in mind, like, they they gave him a two-year extension. Last year was the first year of it uh, because they felt he can be the Mike Hilton replacement. And I think they're right. He just was forced into a tough situation last year with all the injuries they had in the secondary. And he ended up playing about 80% of his snaps on the outside. That's not his game, right? So putting him back in the slot, doing what they expected him to do when they gave him that extension, they let, they let Mike Hilton go as one of the better slot corners. Um, I think he's poised for better things this year. Uh, so maybe a little bit of benefit of the doubt there and, and a optimistic projection with guys like Witherspoon and Sutton, but I do think these guys are, are getting the faith of this staff that like, if I'm going to trust anybody, it's, it's pretty much either Bill Belichick or this staff, and they're going with these guys because there's not really a lot of depth here that's going to push these guys. These are their starters. You have James Pierre, who would be the first man in, played okay as a perimeter corner, but uh, what was he, seventh round pick, undrafted guy, just doesn't have the athleticism to consistently hold up as a perimeter corner. Uh, you have Trey Norwood and Arthur Mollette, our slot hybrid safety types, really physical run defenders, but liabilities and coverage. And then Justin Lane is still here, third round pick with theoretical length and speed. Uh, maybe someday we would have, you know, years ago, we would have said similar things about Akella Witherspoon, but Witherspoon has developed, whereas Justin Lane has not. Uh, so it's not crazy depth by any stretch of the imagination. But then at safety, you got Minka, who's, I, I'm just going to leave it as a top 10 safety. I'm actually not a big fan of his run defense, which if you want to talk about total safety rankings, I, I think you, you got to factor that in. Definitely has range and ball hawking ability as free safety, and he'll make those splash plays, but uh, he has been out of position. He has not been some crazy elite coverage free safety. Still damn, damn good and could have better football ahead of him uh, with, with better talent around him in the secondary. Not trying to shred Minka Fitzpatrick. I I think he's a star safety. I'm just saying, like, you consistently see him ranked as the second or the third best safety in the league. You pretty consistently see him ranked ahead of Jesse Bates if you talk about this division. And I just want to put it out there that I, I don't think he's quite on that level. But 
Uh, it does not mean he's a slouch or anything close to it in coverage. So you got him patrolling the middle of the field and just kind of taking stuff away. They love to go to cover one and cover three, and he'll he'll jump stuff and take those risks and help take the ball away. So you love that. Uh, and then the, the Steelers definitely have a true, like, free safety, strong safety relationship. But it really depends on scheme. Uh, not a lot of teams, though always have this where it's like yep mink is your cover guy and terrell edmonds if he gives you anything in coverage that's great but we're gonna protect him man him up on tight ends and running backs and keep him in short zones and not really ask him to play deep too much but sometimes they get caught in a bind they'll motion and terrell edmonds edmonds has to rotate high and he gets put in a compromising situation like it's just not his game he's more of a linebacker than he is a safety um so they'll protect him, but man, he's just not a good cover safety. They let him test the market for a reason. They end up bringing him back because they do trust his run defense. He's one of the better tackling safeties in the league. Uh, so that's why he's there, uh, but certainly going to be a little bit of a detractor from the coverage grade here. As far as the depth goes, that said, you have DeMonte Casey now. They did not have a coverage safety other than Minka Fitzpatrick last season. Now they do. Casey is a very nice hybrid defensive back type. He's played some slot corner. He can play strong safety, free safety. And I do think now that, you know, Edmonds is on a cheap deal. They brought him back for nothing. You have a guy like Casey. When you get to your dime packages, I think Edmonds might be more of what they've been trying to do with like Marcus Allen and Miles Killebrew, where he's just a linebacker. Like, on third downs and they already do a lot of that with him but even to a more exaggerated degree now and then you can put demonte casey back there and you can go a little bit more too high or have him be more of a cover safety so i love that they they get someone that can buy them some more flexibility and i would say he makes up for a little bit of how much terrell edmonds is a detractor in in coverage and then you have a couple other strong safety backups there. Miles Killebrew, who, who they kind of like. They signed Carl Joseph, though, who I think they're hoping can be the guy that wins that, that backup strong safety job. And, and maybe if he can get back to what he was maybe in 2016, Carl Joseph could even beat out Terrell Edmonds. He has that sort of potential, but he's really struggled the last couple of years. Former first round pick there. Um, so definitely better safety depth than they had last year. I, I appreciate that. And it helps a little bit towards, uh, I think, what's going to be a little bit of a surprising DB coverage ranking of 17th. I don't really hate this secondary. I, I don't think they were some huge liability last year. It certainly wasn't great. But this was still one of the best defenses in the league last year. And you had Akella Witherspoon missing half the season. You had Joe Hayden out there, who I think is worse than any, any of these three corners. You had no safeties to cover other than, than Minka. So... Um, I, I do think it's a, a much improved secondary, and I don't think it's going to be as big of a problem as maybe others could be saying right now. So when you pair the third best pass rush with kind of adequate coverage on the back end, and to me the second best defensive coaching in the league that's going to make the most of that coverage unit, just as we saw last year, you get the fifth best pass defense in the league. And then they actually rank a little bit better third for run defense, and that starts with the depth of the interior defensive line. We alluded to some of it, but uh, Cameron Hayward is an elite run defending defensive tackle. The quickness allows him to play anywhere from five tech to, you know, a two eye, and he has the, I should say, the, the combination of quickness and strength allows him to do that. Uh, one of the better just raw block shedders in the league as far as um, landing those hands, patrolling while maintaining gap discipline and just shed and tackle. So one of the best run defensive, uh, run defending defensive tackles in the league. That's why he said he's a top 10 pass rushing defensive tackle, but a top three to four overall defensive tackle. Uh, so he's obviously an elite impact up front, but it's not just him. You have Tyson Alualu coming back from injury, so you're getting upgraded there. He is 35 years old, coming off a serious injury, so it's no guarantee you can get what you've gotten from him in the last three years, uh, but he has had a really nice career rejuvenation here in Pittsburgh, uh, former top 10 pick for the Jags, 
way overdrafted at the time, but he's turned into a nice pro, still playing at 35 years old. Uh, so an underrated player, if he can get back healthy. If not, I'm not too worried. You have Chris Wormley, who stepped in to this role and had to play a lot last year. He had to play kind of a little bit of Tuitt's role and a little bit of Tyson Alou's role, and he held up just fine. So you have three deep of solid starters plus, and then at least Ogan Joby and Montrevis Adams, these guys have been asked to defend the, the run a lot, and they have aspects of athleticism and strength. They just have, they're um, guys that'll get moved off the ball, and they don't really have that discipline ability. But uh, as third and fourth defensive tackles, you could do a hell of a lot worse. I think DeMarvin Leal, Isaiah Loudermilk will play a role as run defenders as well as kind of hybrid defensive end types. And then we alluded to some of the other defensive tackle depth with like the Davis brothers that have a certain element of potential as well. It's a really nice defensive tackle group, especially against the run. And then on the edge, uh, they do lean to be a little bit lighter, guys that can get moved off the ball and locked into blocks. So that applies both to TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith. That said, uh, TJ Watt is just constantly looking to um, bend in and out of incoming blockers. He can hold his own, even though he's a lighter guy. But again, he, he will get moved by offensive tackles. It just is what it is. He's not the most powerful guy in the world. Um, but just so instinctive. He makes those splash plays. I think he's a stud run defender where he's an elite pass rusher. And then Alex Highsmith does a lot of that similar stuff that TJ Watt does as far as um, sidestepping and, and bending in and around incoming blockers. Showed some good instincts last year. Good pursuit suit speed to contain the edge as well on outside zone. And Highsmith is really beefed up to the point where I think he can hold his own just like TJ Watt can. So uh, it's definitely a good duo of edge, to, edge run defenders. You got a rotational guy in Derek Tuzica who does a, some of that similar stuff. And then not a whole lot on the edge beyond that. But uh, the presence of Cam Hayward, Tyson Alualu, uh, an athletic edge duo to, to warp, warp in and around that. Uh, it gives you the second best D-line run defense in the league. And then when you get to the second level, pretty similar analysis with these guys. Like I think both Devin Bush and Miles Jack will play better here in Pittsburgh. Both guys have shown to be better than they were last season, uh, but do need to prove it. So they rank 16th for D, uh, linebacker run defense. Miles Jack has the size to do it and has been at a point in time, one of the better run defending linebackers in the league. But uh, again, just... I don't know if it, his heart wasn't in it or it was a coaching deal or what last year, but uh, was kind of washed out against the run. And Devin Bush does lack that size. I, I don't think he's a good run defender by any stretch of the imagination, but with open run lanes, as he's going to have here, with Miles Jack being more of the block eater, his just run and chase tackling ability is a really nice asset. So uh, I think, again, that can lead to some better run defense this year. Then you get to the secondary. I'm not worried about what they're getting from the slot. I think Cam Sutton, Trey Norwood, Arthur Millett, all these guys are super physical, quick dudes uh, that can that can hold their own in slot run defense when asked to do it. Uh, on the outside, both Witherspoon, Levi Wallace, slender guys that do get locked into blocks. So you do got to note that. Uh, then your strong safety with, with Terrell Edmonds. He, he is what he is in coverage but he's pretty damn good as a run defender he's built like a built like a linebacker he's got pursuit speed he's one of the more secure tacklers in the league maybe lacks some of that ability to break down runs and get there right away but just the physical ability to the tackling ability it's it's very much there so he's a booster to the db run defense i will criticize minka on his run defense i think it's just an effort thing with him because there's a lot of times where he comes downhill and, and he can make a tackle and, and he has improved his tackling over the years. But, you know, I think there's a little bit of that, you know, this isn't my job <laughs> mentality in, in Minka Fitzpatrick's game. And you'll see him like just kind of not give a damn. And you'll see him with really lazy tackle attempts as well. So I, I'm just I'm going to be a little bit critical of Minka as a run defender, but he's a, he's kind of right as well, like. Most of the time, he's a free safety, and it's not really his job to come down and defend the run, but you still want to see him put in that effort. 
especially when the guy starts to break to the second level. Like you, you, you don't want to be out of position when that happens. So uh, I will be critical of Minka as a run defender. And then you also got to note Carl Joseph. If anything happens to Terrell Edmonds, you got a pretty solid backup there. So uh, your run defense is going to rank third in the league. Of course, the defensive coaching, again, being an amplifier to this, because when you have a Cameron Hayward up front, you're able to basically put everyone else in a defined role just say play with good discipline do your job and you're going to shut down the run and that is what the pittsburgh steelers have consistently done so third for total run defense and that ends up giving you the second best defense in the nfl i don't think that's a stretch at all uh, they to me were one of the three or five best defenses last year and you did get better in my opinion i think the staff got better i think the pass rush got better i think the coverage got better so it's what's going to give this team a chance right they rank 26th for offense you're hoping they can take care of the ball have a decent run game have these receivers make plays for you get you 17 to 21 points a week and play dominant defense and is that going to be enough in this afc well let's take a look at their schedule their over under is seven wins so that right there tells you people aren't believing them and their schedule's pretty tough and I agree. You're playing in the AFC North where you've got the defending AFC champs and the Baltimore Ravens who are going to give you fits. And then we don't really know what's going on with the Cleveland Browns, but if they got Deshaun Watson, you have a chance to get swept by this division. If, if you know, I don't think Watson ends up playing the year, but if he does, you might get swept by your division. So that's really freaking hard. You got to be perfect outside of that to make the playoffs. And they got to play the AFC East. So you're dealing with Buffalo, you're dealing with New England, you got to go to Miami that's going to be a slugfest that could go either way. NFC South, and just as luck has it, both of your uh, the bad teams in that division, the Falcons and the Panthers, are later in the year where they'll have time to figure themselves out a little bit, and they're on the road. So that's a bad beat. Beyond that, you got to go to the Colts, and you got to host the Raiders, and you got to go to Philadelphia. So of course, a lot of these games are winnable and I do see a path for them to continue what they've done and win nine, 10, 11 games is a stretch, I think, but nine or 10 continue to have a winning season. Maybe that's enough in this AFC, I doubt it. Um, but when you're a defensive minded team, you're gonna just be creating slugfests and you're just increasing that margin for error and you're opening the door to randomness causing games to go one way or another. Now they're good at mitigating that randomness with good coaching and sound um, fundamental football. And, and that's what they live off of. But man, they are just playing with fire here. Uh, and I'm I'm not going to bet against them. I'm not going to, I'm certainly not going to bet the under here. I think, I think they are a seven or an eight win team in most scenarios, but I'm not going to bet the over either because I think the AFC is too good. And there's, there are still too many question marks with this offense, but um, man, Mike Tomlin hasn't done it in 15 years. So probably just going to make us all look like idiots and they'll somehow be playing in the AFC championship. I, I don't know, uh, but uh, no, seriously, probably not. <laughs> this, this, this is a good football team, but uh, I think this AFC is going to be a little bit too much for them to handle. And they'll probably be finally in the outside looking in come mid-January but I really hope you guys enjoyed this deep dive and I hope you're enjoying the series again please do hit that like button if we could get this video just get these back to 2,000 likes um, if you're still here you watched the, all the way through you haven't hit that like button uh, just take a second to hit it really helps me out of course subscribe so you don't miss any more of these and let me know in the comments down below what you think of this ranking for the Steelers will Mike Tomlin have his first losing losing season in his career Appreciate you for watching, and we'll see you in a few days for the next deep dive. Peace out.